Hi, how you guys doing? How are you? This is uh, Faisal Fahimi speaking. Uh, this is basically a response video. Let me just uh, read a, a verse from the Bible first. Okay, it says, uh, "Do not." It's Matthew five, verse seventeen. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So this is the New Testament, you know. So Jesus is saying basically, you know, he has come to fulfill the laws of the Old Testament, which is the Torah, and to fulfill the laws of the previous prophets. He's not here to abolish the laws of the Old Testament or the prophets. And besides, according to Christianity, uh, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, the Torah. Okay, so. I, I also have made some other response videos please click below in my channel uh, where it says American Bangladeshi Muslim Faisal Fahim and you will see also some other response videos which I have made against uh, various people like David Wood, Nabil, Mufasil um, Islam etc etc so watch this video and after that also click on my channel below and uh, that's American Malashi Muslim Faisal Fahim and watch other response videos over there and watch this video as well. Thank you so much. If Jesus is the God who inspired the Old Testament, why did he command Moses and Joshua to kill women and children? Why did he command that? And when is the killing of children morally justifiable? Well, uh, uh, I think that's a good question. I'm not sure I could answer it in three minutes. Uh, and nor can I say that this is the, the official Christian position. I'll say, I can say what we're dealing with, though. Um, as far as issues like this bothering me, I think you and I are different. You look at all of these issues I bring up and you, it's just a smoke screen. This is just ridiculous. This is, this is no objection at all. And I'm looking at it and going, whoa, this is wild. Whoa, this is wild. Whoa, this is wild. But I'm like that with the Bible, too. I'm like that with the Bible. There, I will say right now, there are tons of things in the Bibles that really, really bother me. There are tons of things in the Bibles that really, really bother me. There are tons of things in the Bibles that really, really bother me. There are tons of things in the Bibles that really, really bother me. And the difference is, I think that Christianity can actually deal with these problems. I don't think that Islam can. And, and I, I think people have seen that tonight because you've had an opportunity to answer and you keep pointing the finger at Christianity. As far as Jesus being the God of the Old Testament, um, here's, here's, here's the data we have. One, lots of really bad things in the Old Testament. One, lots of really bad things in the Old Testament. One, lots of really bad things in the Old Testament. One, lots of really bad things in the Old Testament. And then two, Jesus coming along and saying, you have heard that it was said eye for eye, tooth for tooth, Old Testament. But now I tell you, um, love your neighbor, turn your other cheek, things of, things of this nature. Um, pray for those who persecute you. So we see, yes, we do see a huge change. And the, the question is, uh, why this change? And I would say, and this is, this is, this is my personal theology, I think that um, human beings, um, I do need the fall here, uh, human beings have, are in rebellion against God, and I believe that God, uh, during the Old Testament, said something along these lines, um, if you'd like a world uh, where you can do what you want, that's your choice, but I have to be separate from you. And so God withdraws. God withdraws from humankind, uh, not completely, I think that would kill us, but God withdraws and then we have human beings um, sort of uh, not, not having God there to, to guide them in all things. And so we get the law, and I think that part of the point of the law, there are lots of uh, purposes of the law, I think part of that purpose um, is to show, do you really want to live this way apart from God and just be living by law? Um, these very harsh laws. Um, I think part of that was to, was to show us you don't want to live like this. And now what do we have? With the incarnation, we have Jesus returning to the world, God coming back to live among us, and then saying, look, now you see a different way. Now you see what life is like when I am among you. And he heals everyone. And he preaches peace. And saying, this is how life, this is how life should be. And so, uh, well, I mean, the bottom line, whether, whether that view is, is correct or not, Christianity and Islam 
aren't in the same boat here. Our greatest revelation said, turn the other cheek. Um, our greatest revelation never had any slaves, um, didn't have multiple wives, um, didn't have a nine-year-old wife, um, and this goes for Jesus and, and, and people like Paul. It was, it's a completely different picture. And so going to the Old Testament, um, it's, uh, it's just not the best approach for the Christian because if you say, hey, look at the Old Testament, isn't that wrong? Jesus said that was wrong. Don't live like that. That's what Jesus said. It would say something to the effect of go into any city and slaughter their women and children, just like the Bible says. By the standards of the Bible, I can't accept that Moses was a prophet then. I do not believe a prophet would kill women and children. Never. Now, Mr. Wood completely ignored my question. He's saying that's what the Old Testament said. And then we have Jesus coming. That was Jesus. According to Orthodox Christian orthodoxy. Unless he's a Marcionite. Maybe he's a Marcionite. Maybe he believes that God is a different God. That was Jesus telling the Israelites. He commands them. It's very clear. Att arise and attack the Midianites. Kill their women. Only the young girls for yourselves. This is, this, and this is, according to the Talmud, this is how the Jews took that inspiration from Jesus to rape three-year-old girls. And there's no reproach in the Bible about what they, God does. Well, no, that's not what I meant. You know, so he has a lot of sophistry. You know, he's a philosopher, so he's, he's dancing around the issue. Now, Muhammad killed 1,500 people. This was in defense. These were in wars. These were in wars. He didn't go out and okay, kill him, you, you, you. No, 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 no. People are attacking him and he sends, he sends armies against them because they're attacking him. What happened? He was always outnumbered. The Battle of Badr, three, three to one odds. The Battle of Uhud, four to one odds. He's defending his community now. Now he's in a position of power to defend. You see, now as far as uh, um, you know, advocating slavery, what does Jesus say about that you know, in the New Testament? What do you say about that? Now, first of all, it should be noted that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he reformed this. He actually said in sound hadith that uh, uh, your slaves are your brethren. Feed and clothe them like you do your own brothers. And then he eventually abolishes. Who, and he said, whoever frees a slave, God will free from paradise. What does Jesus say in Luke 12, 47? He says, the, the servant who disobeys his master's will, flog him many times with many lashes. Right? Now look at the Prophet's family. His adopted son, Zayd ibn Haditha, he was described as having a flat nose and dark skin. He is called Hibbu Rasulillah, the beloved of the Messenger of God. He was a black man. The first man to do the Adhan, the call to prayer, Bilal ibn Rabah, handpicked by the Prophet himself, a former Abyssinian slave that the Prophet exalted on top of the Kaaba to make the call to prayer. This was a black man. And this at, time, at the time to the Quraysh was like, what's this man doing? This is our slave. What is he doing on top of the house of God? Right? And then after the Prophet's mother died, the woman who took care of him, her name was Barakah bin Thalaba, also known as Umm Ayman. She was a woman of Abyssinian descent. She was a black woman. The Prophet said, she is like my mother after my mother. A black woman. So the, the woman he considered to be his mother, a black woman. The first man to do the Adhan he appointed, black man. His adopted son, called the beloved of the Messenger of God, described as a black man. What does the Bible say about these, about these issues? The Prophet says, Kullukum min Adam wa Adam in Torah. All of you are from Adam, and Adam is from dust. Um, Peter says, slaves must be submissive to their masters, even in fear and trembling, even if they're harsh. The Bible did nothing to, re to, re to, uh, to help this problem in the world of slavery. I'm, done, I'm out of time. The following is a presentation of God Questions Ministries. What did Jesus mean by coming to bring a sword? Matthew chapter 10 verses 34 through 36 describes Jesus telling the disciples that he came not to bring peace to the world, but a sword. Jesus' sword was never a literal one. In fact, when Peter took up a sword to defend Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus rebuked him and told him to put away his sword. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Matthew 26 verse 52. Why then did Jesus say, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. What kind of sword did Jesus come to bring? Among the names of Jesus Christ is that of Prince of Peace. Such verses as Isaiah 9, verse 6, Luke 2, verse 14, and John 14, verse 27 make it clear that Jesus came to bring peace. But that peace is between man and God. Those who reject God and the only way of salvation through Jesus will find themselves perpetually at war with God. But those who come to Him in repentance will find themselves at peace with God. Because of Christ's sacrifice, we are restored to a relationship of peace with God. Still, 
it is inevitable that there will be conflict between good and evil, the Christ and the Antichrist, the light and the darkness, the children of God and the children of the devil. Conflict must arise between the two groups. We should seek to be at peace with all men, but should never forget that Jesus warned we will be hated for his sake. Because those who reject him hate him, they will hate his followers as well. In Matthew 10, verses 34 through 36, Jesus said he had come at this time not to bring peace to the earth, but a sword, a weapon which divides and severs. As a result of his visit to the earth, some children would be set against parents, and a man's enemies might be those within his own household. This is because many who choose to follow Christ are hated by their family members. This may be part of the cost of discipleship, for love of family should not be greater than love for the Lord. A true disciple must take up his cross and follow Jesus. He must be willing to face not only family hatred, but also death, like a criminal carrying his cross to his own execution. True followers of Christ must be willing to give up, even to the point of hating all that is in our lives. In so doing, we find our lives in return for having given them up to Jesus Christ. God Questions Ministry seeks to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ by providing biblical answers to today's questions. Online at gotquestions.org. Ethical mistakes. According to Surah 865, killing becomes lawful to the God who said, Thou shalt not kill. O Prophet, exhort the believers to fight. Again in 484 we read, So fight, O Muhammad, in the way of Allah, and urge on the believers. The Arabic word means not only to fight, but to kill as well. There are many other verses which express the same philosophy, almost a hundred of them, forcing people to accept this religion by the sword. Jesus, the Messiah of God, taught his followers six centuries earlier to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God to love their enemies and not to kill them. How is it that we go backwards in this serious ethical issue instead of higher standard? Indeed. Does the Quran have ethical problems? The Quran says fight and kill. But Dr. Shirosh, you should be aware that the Bible says that too. In fact, I'm not aware that any book other than the Bible has such vicious verses. In the introduction, well, okay, you admit Old Testament. Okay, so it's in your Bible, in the Old Testament. Old Testament is part of your Bible, true? True. So the same God, yes? But so the same God that was so vicious in the Old Testament is mildly vicious in the Quran. So you, you're fine with that? No. No? Okay. <laughs> so you want to have your vicious God and keep him to yourself? You don't want the Quran to have it? Loving. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, what you find in the Quran is, in fact, uh, instructions on how the Muslims should deal with those who are trying to attack the Muslims. So, for example, uh, Surah 22, verses number 39 and 40 says, uh, Permission is given to those who are being attacked for them to fight back because Allah is able to help them. And uh, these people, it goes on to describe these people, uh, uh, the, the rationale is given. These are the people who have been driven out of their homes for no just reason except that they said our Lord is Allah. And then a further justification. If it had not been that Allah used some people to drive back the attackers, then the mosques, the synagogues, the churches, and uh, the, uh, the monasteries would uh, be demolished. So in other words, the Quran is telling Muslims that they should take up arms in order to defend religious freedom. So that not only Muslims but Jews and Christians could have the freedom to worship in their places of worship and these places should not be demolished uh, by uh, invaders and attackers.